I'm delighted to be here today to share our perspectives on uh, some of the needs that we see around AI in businesses and how that's driving research in the community. Just for context, I currently serve as the Director of Research in Fujitsu's um, lab in Silicon Valley. We're a global research organization. Uh, it's when somebody asks me, oh, you work for Fujitsu, is that the company that makes those cameras? So uh, it's not the company that makes those cameras, but it is actually a $50 billion company that makes everything from AAA cells to RFID tags to transatlantic cables. And it's, it's the largest IT provider in Japan. And is the OEM for a large variety of businesses, which gives the research organizations a large variety of challenges to work on. And uh, I'll talk to you today about some of the work that we've been, some of the perspectives that we have been working with in the Digital Life Lab, whose mission for the last several years has been to enable humans and machines to collaborate in our increasingly digital world. And specifically, we have had a keen focus on the human in the loop in these digital systems. We started several years ago in looking at systems that provided real-time sensor fusion as we were at that time starting to move into a sensor-driven world. And we were motivated by applications in precision health. Uh, a few years after that, a few years ago, we started looking at not just presenting really wonderful, wise insights to the human beings and leaving it at that, but encompassing the human experience with an always-on AI assistant, which meets the data for them and is aware of the human being's goals and guides them through their activities in life. And now we are looking at the collaboration between humans and machines in a, uh, in a way where both the machine and the human being are aware of each other and they're part of each other's computational fab fabric. And that brings me to um, what I'd like to share with you today about transparent AI. So uh, we start from the belief that uh, the digital world that we all inhabit today uh, gives us the promise of systemically augmenting human sensing with, with the Internet of Things, with sensors embedded all over our environment with systemically augmenting human decision making with a lot of modules from artificial intelligence and systemically augmenting human action with software and hardware robots. So, so as we move from the world of the current world that we live in, which is primarily in our view, a world of intelligences that are apart. Our intelligence is somewhat apart from machine intelligence. And there will come a time when we'll be living in a world where intelligence, intelligences other than ours are moving around the world autonomously. But we believe that for the next decade or two, the era that we are in now is the augmented era. And businesses have also wised up to this mindset. They actually are, uh, we hear from business customers all the time, and they're asking us, how do we organize, uh, how do we reorganize our assets, our people and machines, so that we are not in an intelligence as a part world, we are in an intelligence as augmented world. And uh, as Neil said, this is not, out of a philosophical desire to move us to an autonomous age. It is a competitive need uh, to succeed because if you do not augment your human insights and intuitions with machine insight and intuitions, somebody else will. And, uh, and so our starting point for our research explorations is this need in business customers to, uh, to have AI that enables true human AI co-creation. So does AI today actually offer true co-creation. So let's take an example. Let's say I am uh, somebody who's responsible for customer service in a large airline or some large company who, which gets a large volume of customer requests. And I want to quickly triage customer service requests based on how agitated the customer seems. Um, I have a lot of data that is labeled. I know based on a certain text transcript whether the person was agitated, whether they had a severe request or not. And now I want AI to be part of the loop so that uh, triage happens. So I ask a AI engineer on my team, somebody with some graduate experience in AI, can you build me a service like this? And so they say, well, let me give, give me some data. Give me some data and I'm gonna break it into some training data and, and, I'll, and I'll use it to train my models and then test it on my test data. And uh, with all the knowledge that they have, they construct an AI pipeline uh, deciding on data representations and AI models based on the knowledge that they have and go through the process of training and testing this pipeline. And the metric that they really use is, is the performance of this pipeline good enough? And you can, you can see that uh, the 
current state of AI education and training teaches a lot of heuristic ways in which to meet these performance metrics. Uh, they work well, but they work within the metrics as the, as the AI engineer defines them and understands them. So the overall interaction between the humans in the loop co-creating AI today is really to start with data, create a pipeline, train it, and to test it using these performance metrics. Um, is that sufficient? Is that something what we would want uh, in a business that truly wants to empower people who are designing uh, and leading customer service or other business units to uh, incorporate AI in the most appropriate way in, into their business functions? So the first bias that we come across if we continue to work this way is the perspective bias. The engineer will have a certain view of the world. We all have a certain view of the world, but they'll have a certain data-driven view of the world and will ask for certain data to solve the problem that they were given. The data itself has bias. Uh, we heard previous speakers talk about the problems that this bias creates if these, these decisions are being used to uh, decide who you will hire or who uh, or how long somebody who comes in front of a judge will be uh, given a sentence for. But this bias exists in all kinds of uh, business data. Um, then there is the engineer's own knowledge bias. We were taking a look at uh, the rate of papers in just machine learning, which is just a small subset, well, a large subset, a subset of artificial intelligence. And there's about 100 papers per month. Uh, I think that's probably a conservative estimate per month of new papers, new technologies, new ways of meeting these performance metrics just in, in, in machine learning. So certainly people who are doing these things in real businesses are not aware of these technologies and the, these new approaches, so they're going to have their own bias of what models work best for the problem that they're given. And um, I think because AI is so exciting, AI is so capable, there is a need for these engineers to just make these models work on the data that they're given from, um, from the business stakeholders they work with. So we, we think of this as um, uh, leaving a lot of room for improvement. So this is a lot of people working with black boxes in a process that they don't, themselves don't understand with not enough knowledge of where the state of the art is. And this kind of dark AI we don't believe is suited for the kind of uh, true augmentation we hear businesses asking for. So who might we want to support with an alternative? Uh, we already have the AI engineer as part of the loop, but the application engineer or the system engineer who's building these services currently using APIs with even less understanding of what those, what's encapsulated behind those APIs, perhaps we would like to make those APIs and what they mean and how to use them more transparent to those folks. But most importantly and uh, to us, people who are actually in the business of understanding what these services will do for people who use these services, who talk to uh, future clients, who understand their requirements, how can we involve them in the design of these AI services themselves and the end user themselves? So, so, so already the participation of application engineers in the building of AI services is emerging. Uh, and we'd like to enable others to participate as well. So what might this participation look like? Um, how might a business person who is a, let's say they have no knowledge of uh, AI engineering, have not taken uh, courses in AI, uh, how might they actually co-create with AI? Well, perhaps they would start by asking a trained AI some question, some question that makes sense to, some, some question that makes sense to them. We call this accessible AI. We're starting to see small versions of accessible AI where you can upload data sets uh, with uh, accessible interfaces on website and ask simple questions around those data sets. But we really mean this in the general sense. You should be able to ask a trained AI a question that is within your vocabulary, and the AI should be able to give you an answer within your vocabulary. The answer should also come with an explanation. We, we heard some reasons for interpretability or explainability in previous talks. Uh, but this explanation allows the business person to understand, do I believe this answer? Is this good enough for me? Um, and there is a lot of research that has started over the last two, three years uh, in the US and elsewhere on explainable AI. Um, now, a business person does not usually have uh, a well-structured training data set or a test data set to match this result against. What they do have is beliefs, and uh, they are really persistent beliefs that people in businesses have, especially people who are um, 
responsible for strategy, for ownership of a particular sales unit, about how, what's the, what's the real nature of their client's needs? What's the real nature of what makes a product successful? And if the answer, in, and what happens when you receive a result from an AI is that answer is matched against that belief. It's not matched against sort of more objective data, it's matched against more subjective beliefs. If there is consistency, we move on, but if there isn't consistency, we sort of start the loop again of asking the AI once more, perhaps a different question, perhaps asking the AI to look at a different piece of data. And this interactivity, we find, is really crucial to enable the business people to participate, to, to co-create with the AI. And we repeat this until the AI is updated, because now it's looking at a different data set, which has been augmented by interaction with a human being, or the person's belief has been updated, leading to new strategies or new ways of approaching um, their original problem. So this overall interaction now is um, ask a question of a trained AI, receive an answer with an explanation, test it against your beliefs, and update the belief or the AI. And we can imagine uh, technologies that automatically recognize, given an AI module, what kind of usable tuners that might, might exist so that you don't actually have to go through a, a long uh, interactive process to figure out how you might update this AI. But the AI itself, or, or technology, uh, looks at the AI, inspects the AI, and says, here are some tuners that you can use to change how this AI behaves if you didn't like what it originally gave you. We call this tunable AI. So when we use the term transparent AI, we're, we're encompassing all these different efforts within the AI community to make AI more accessible, explainable, interactive, and tunable. Uh, we believe this will uh, lead to a very different kind of co-creation than we have today. So that's the so to sort of the business uh, use case from the point of view of the current stakeholders wanting to be more involved in the use of AI as they design new kinds of products and they, as they think about business problems in new ways. But there is also, uh, we, this was referenced in a previous talk as well, there's also some uh, new regulations on the horizon. So the European Union's general data protection regulation will become effective in May of 2018. If you go to their website, they have this, um, they have this timer, which uh, last night was a 214, 204 days, and it's a big deal. It sort of talks about how companies that manage the data of European citizens uh, need to manage the data, all the way from privacy to if you're making decisions based on that data. Uh, there is a right to explanation described between some articles and some recitals in the overall uh, code that says that a user may have a right to ask for an explanation of an algorithmic decision made about them. Um, there are debates going on right now between legal experts and business policy experts whether this is a legally binding requirement depending on because of the way it is distributed between different articles and recitals in the, in, in the, in the European Union's requirement. But it's very clear that it, it, it creates a new bar that many businesses will now have some economic imperative to meet as well. So I want to tell you about a little uh, experience that we had in our lab working uh, on ways of increasing transparency when somebody who's responsible for, for making sales uh, decisions interacts with an AI and what learnings we had from it. So uh, the data and the names in this example are anonymized. Um, Allison, she's the head of sales for a large uh, global business unit doing about a billion dollars of sales annually. And uh, she came to us and said, you know, I, you know, I always want to increase my win percentage. I want to just have more wins in my sales contract. How do I do this? Now, um, this is a person who has access to a variety of business intelligence dashboards, custom <coughs> dashboards that have been created for her by her um, programming team that let her look at various metrics on a daily basis. But yet she, you know, is trying to see how AI can benefit her. So she asked this question to us, and what features of uh, we, we track about uh, 50 different features in all our sales contract. Which of these features really impact the win percentage of a contract? And so we worked with her and we said, well, you know, the total contract price seems to be a really important variable here. Um, if you have a lower contract price, you have a higher percentage of winning. That's not a really exciting uh, kind of insight for a business person to hear. They don't want to, you know, start, uh, you know, putting out contracts that are very low price just to win them. And so she didn't quite buy that. She said, well, so you see that suddenly she has... There's a belief she holds about 
what should be a successful strategy about increasing win percentage, the AI's answer does not meet that belief. So a conversation starts. A conversation starts which requires some interactivity in the platform for it to proceed with the business person and the AI directly. So we created such a platform for her which allows us to ask questions like, well, I think that these uh, contract renewals which tend to be tend to have very high win percentage, which is easy for us to get a contract renewal, but they're not, they don't, uh, they don't, they're not for large dollar amounts. Let's take those out, and then let's see what the AI says. So we said, well, it's the same result after re uh, uh, removing those contracts as well. I said, really? I am not sure I believe you. So show me all this data. And she had this entire sequence of interactions that she engaged in with us uh, and the platform we built, acting as the interactive AI, to answer a variety of questions that she had once she sliced, sliced and diced the data in different ways. And that's, so that was her experience of AI-driven exploration. And, and after looking at all those data, she had this insight, her own belief about um, how this billion dollar annual sales were structured was actually updated after several hours of this interactivity that the majority of contracts, even though they don't show up on the data specifically under a column that says it's renewals, they have characteristics that make them very much like renewals. And um, once we took those out, then we said, well, AI, what, what, let's, so now we're talking to an updated AI because the AI is now looking at new data. Now, what, uh, what do we do now? So the lower price was no longer better, something else was more important, and it led to a new strategy that we must focus on getting contracts that don't have the same characteristics as contract renewals, um, and there were certain other things that the AI showed her about how to go towards that goal. So to us, this, is, this was an example of she by herself did not know the answer. The AI by, by itself uh, knew the wrong answer because there was bias in the data that it was given to it. By work, working together, by building technologies that had reduced the friction in how this non-AI engineer was able to interact with the data and the AI, we were able to update both. What might this mean for the design of AI systems, transparent AI systems in general? Um, this, is, uh, this, is sort of, this is just preliminary thinking about it, but I'll give it a shot um, with this audience. Um, so one of our takeaways from that experience is that uh, the human being was looking for an understanding of why the AI is saying what it's saying. The AI certainly gets its understanding of what the human being wants from the data it's, it's, it's being given. So talking about the human being first, if we sort of like look at a graph where dimensionality is on the y-axis and variability, meaning how many kinds of experiences of that kind you might have, you know, we have a variety of, we have a lot of experiences. There's a lot of, there's a lot of vectors to our experience. There's a lot of aspects to our experience. Our experience is a high dimensional space. There's also variability in our experience. But our beliefs are probably less variable are likely less variable than our experiences are. And in fact, being less variable, they also influence our experiences to be less variable than they otherwise would be. And they also sort of seem to occupy a low dimensionality space. We don't have, uh, we don't seem to be open as human beings to too many aspects about our beliefs. Um, what about data? Data certainly allows for more variability because it is not uh, subject to the same Digital data is not subject to the same human cognitive biases. And then the predictions that come from that data are also similarly more variable. They can point you to new things. And they may also be, uh, live in a higher dimens dimensional space than your beliefs, meaning they may, may talk about some factors that are latent that you're not thinking about yourself. Uh, and the first thing that happens when you try to when you try to solve this problem, uh, solve the problem of transparency for AI, is you have to solve the problem of the awareness gap. The human being, when presented with digital data, or the, the prediction that comes from the digital data, if it doesn't meet with their belief, says, ah, you know, your data, you, you weren't aware of this other thing that's part of my experience, so you haven't been measuring this. That's why I don't agree with this. So this, this, is, this, this is a real problem, actually. Um, the other one is the persuasion gap. The, AI says something, but it says it very rationally. And, um, you know, people feel differently about this, but my belief is that rational, rationality is just one out of many belief systems. There's other belief systems. Faith is a belief system. Social proof is a, social participation is a belief system. So uh, a lot of the presentation of AI 
to human beings and businesses in particular seems to, seems to follow the rational belief system. And it doesn't work in practice. So there is a persuasion gap between the human being accepting the AI model prediction and the belief. So to look at an extreme version, if, just to give you a sense of how much a belief can, uh, can how much belief can be different from the data, um, let me give you an, show, you, show you a picture. And if we ask an AI, which of these two pictures has more people in it? Um, I think we know what the, what the digital answer is going to be. But if you ask, but if you then try to engage a human being in a conversation about, well, the AI said this has, I don't know, a million people, that has 300,000 people. Uh, they would suddenly tell you that you are not aware of certain angles, you're not aware of certain things. There is, there is, there is a completely different conversation that happens because the beliefs are very different. So one of the things that transparency, that transparency for AI will, in order to get to transparent AI, one of the things AI will need to do is to be aware of the beliefs of the people that they are working with. And that's, that's essential. So with that, with interaction between the human being and the data that they're presented with, we get to augmented data, data that is enhanced by taking into account the perspectives of the person that they're working with. We actually get to an augmented experience. We have a new sense of our own reality because of what the AI showed us. And I think this is where it falls upon the AI to create a persuasive experience of that, of that data that they're giving them so that the experience is felt and not just seen, uh, leading to augmented beliefs. So, so different aspects of transparent AI offer the promise of moving us from our human experiences and beliefs and the cycles between them that are susceptible to our very human cognitive biases to augmented experience where we can benefit from the insights from digital data and digital predictions, but experience them in ways that actually gives us more superpowers and more senses about our own problems. Let me switch uh, to talk about one more thing. This comes from a sister team of ours in our lab in Japan. They have been working on another aspect of transparency, uh, explainability. In particular, they have been working on a deep learning network called DeepTensor that is especially designed to work on graph data. And in, uh, the particular example that they've been working with recently uh, looks at graph structure data that is created from medical texts. So uh, you, you give it a lot of medical texts talking about gene mutations, genes, drugs, diseases. It creates a graph between potential correlations between all those things. The deep learning network learns a representation of that graph which makes it easier to determine which of those components, drugs, gene mutations, and genes actually lead to a particular disease. So that's the AI part of it. But what they've, been, what they've done recently is to add an explanation to this process as well. They have uh, augmented the deep learning network so that it identifies certain inference nodes that explain how the deep network works. One example of this is that once the explanation is provided, uh, the result of that deep network gives you a subset of your original input graph and says, these are possible paths. The, the purple dots, by the way, are certain diseases, and you're looking for pathways that actually lead to those diseases. So you take the output of the deep learning network, which has been explained to you because of these identification of these inference points, and apply knowledge, domain knowledge from biology, to eliminate certain paths that don't make sense. And once you have a path, so for example, that path did not make sense because it starts from a gene and it should actually have a mutation before, uh, before, uh, before it, based on the domain knowledge in that area. So this is a path that makes sense based on domain knowledge, and then what they do is connect it to actual scientific literature saying, okay, we are saying that this sequence of mutations and, and, and drugs can, is relevant to the, these disease, and here is scientific um, uh, references supporting that. So we are not, um, we are part of a growing, I would say a rapidly growing community in this quest for transparent AI. I would say the quest for accessible AI is being driven most, um, most 
robustly by the industry. We have commercial platforms for guided interaction with some AI models. The quest for explainable AI most recently has been catalyzed by DARPA's program on explainable AI that started about a year ago. Interactive AI fairness, accountability, and ethics require, I think, participation of people who have the ability to think about not just data science, but also cognitive science, about belief systems, about anthropology. And this is an emerging and very exciting field. And if you're interested in this work in general, this sort of, this, um, this new lens on AI in general, a couple of hubs to start from that I recommend are the Future of Life Institute's AI track and the partnership on AI. And with that, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>